Welcome to the Steady On Stronger Together podcast. I am your host, Angie Ballman. Devon White is a writer, Bible teacher, poet, and an amazing storyteller. She has a passion for expressing the truths found in Scripture, and her recent project, The Three Women of Christmas, invited her readers into deep connection with Anna, Elizabeth, and Mary. I invited Devon to talk with me about those women and other women who cross paths with Jesus because the truth about how important women are in the gospel stories knows no season. I know you are going to be encouraged by Devon's teaching. Let's listen in. Hello, Steady On friends, and welcome to this Stronger Together conversation. I'm Angie Bauman, and my guest today is Devon White. Devon, welcome. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Thank you for having me. Thrilled to be together. Devon is a writer and a Bible teacher and lives in Pennsylvania. Tell me a little bit about yourself and your family, if you will, before we dive in. So we live, of course, in Northwest PA. I have a husband, Mark. We've been married, will be 32 years. Ooh. So high school, we were married. I was 19. We have two sons. So by the time we were in our 20s, we were having babies. I have one son who um, is a language teacher in Massachusetts, Holyoke, Massachusetts. And I have a, my second son, Jeremy, is an RN in an ER department in Columbus, Ohio. So they are out there doing doing their things. You have done it, Mama. We have, and it's <laughs> it's strange. Yeah. It is, empty nest is not what it's cracked up to be. Is that right? My boys yeah. are sixteen and eleven, so I'm not there. Um, but yeah, I think about it sometimes because it's been a long time right now that, that mothering has been such a huge part of my life. Yeah. Right. And you have that daily, you have teen boys. So they're eating massive amounts of food and it's you're incredible. Like, it's like, I think I spend most of my life, like in that phase, like just standing in the kitchen. That's what I was always doing. Just standing in there making things. And then it's like, all of a sudden they, in college, they come and go. So you have one, you have another, you have people here over the summer. And then all of a sudden, one summer, everybody just went on their way. So it is strange. My husband and I took up cycling just because we like needed something fun. And it's been the best thing we could have done. Awesome. We have lots of beautiful trails near us. And so we just hop on our bikes. It, you know, took me a while to get the hang of things again, but it was a great thing to do. So we've been doing that. So it makes it a little better. Yeah. Yeah. Well, tell me a little bit about the book that you have written. I know that it was, was it just this Christmas that it was released? So it's still yeah, pretty it's new Christmas yes. and it's kind of a, about Christmas. But when I reached out to you, I felt like, and I think you agreed that there are, there are certainly Christmassy lessons to be learned, but from these women, there are evergreen lessons to be learned. Are there not? But tell me just a little bit about the project and kind of what motivated you to of all the things to write on kind of why this. Okay. So um, the three women of Christmas is the little ebook that I wrote. And honestly, I do a lot of biblical storytelling locally. So at churches at our coffee house um, downtown, I would come in and tell the stories live for people on a Friday night. So we do a whole series of the women of Christmas or the women of Easter or the women in the lineage, you know, different stories and the power of story. And if we look through the Bible, what do we see? God's story, people's stories intertwined with each other. Yes. And our story shows yes. up there often. And so that's why I love, love, love telling the stories of the Bible. And it began for me in children's church teaching that's where I became a, a believer at 19, right after marriage, but my pastor's wife threw me right into the preschool class and I learned right along all those stories. So I've always loved them. And so these women, of course, we think of them at Christmas time. We might even think of them at Easter, but their life stories are so powerful all year long. They really, really are. And I love how God brought three women in the mix in his salvation story and they all played their part and they all had to say yes 
to what God was calling them to do. And so um, because of COVID, of course, everything was down and we had a whole long like spring of nothing. And so I'm like, you know, I'm going to write them out now. And I've been writing about them on my blog and I do a lot of speaking on different women of the Bible. So that was my time. I said, I'm going to do this just for projects for something to do. So that's how it came to be. And it was a fun process and a good learning process for sure. So who are these three women? Will you introduce us to the three women of Christmas that, that were the main characters of your, of your project, uh, introduce us to them and kind of how was their devotion to God displayed as you put it? What, what is their yes? Yeah. So of course our first woman is Anna. And so we come upon her story. She is um, a widow. She was married for seven years. We see no children have come into play. Um, And then suddenly she's widowed. She's still very young. And so she has a choice to make. She can choose to go back and live with her parents. That could have been considered a burden at the time. Um, And she would have just lived her life out hoping maybe some other man would marry her. Or the choice came before her at some point, we don't see that moment where she says, no, I'm going to go, I'm going to serve at the temple, I'm going to live a life of prayer, fasting and worship, and that will be my life. And, you know, we read in a story and we go, isn't that great? And uh, just went to the temple and lived a life in prayer and worship and fasting. And we think, oh, good for her. And I think, what a sacrifice. We're talking decades. Oh my gosh. Her earthly life was spent there in a posture of prayer, of of fasting, of worship, night and day, day and night. Um, Not easy. When you think about if I were to say, let's all sit and pray for one hour, how difficult we would find that and how disciplined Anna had to have been. And knowing, and then I just think in those moments, all those years, what was revealed to her by the Lord? What did she hear? What did she know? And then we, of course, we see her with Simeon as Mary and Joseph are getting ready to present Christ. And she gets to hold the fruit of all of those years in her arms. And I, every time I think of it, it just gives me chills. She, oftentimes we pray for things yeah. and we never get to see the fruit, mm-hmm. but we have to trust that it's there. And I was so blessed to hold that babe, our salvation in her arms that she had prayed for longed for, warred for in that room. Is, there's a connection for me in time with the Lord and recognizing the answer to our prayer, I think, because I think so often I'm interested in your thoughts on this. So often, I believe the Lord is always answering us. I also believe I miss it uh, sometimes because, or often I might even say, because it doesn't maybe look the way I expected, doesn't look the way I wanted, or um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm just busy and distracted. And so I wait for him to answer when actually his answer has already been there. But I think this life of devotion that you're talking about from Anna, when you're, when you're connected, when your heart is connected to his heart, then you see things and understand things that you miss when it's not, I don't know. How do you, what do you think about that? I agree. And I think with us, of course, we're, we're, we're in a culture where we, it's super fast and we are on that plane. Anna was in a culture and in a time where things were not quick. I mean, just doing the laundry was a long, long process. And so here we have her, um, her presence with God. And isn't that what he really wants from us? Not so much to answer or grant what we're praying for, but that we become partners in that. And I think in, in those, in those years, Anna's walk with God had to have been so very close and so in his presence. I mean, where more so could you be in his presence than a complete life devoted to being in his presence, basically. And what was revealed there and what she knew and did she know what was coming and when he was coming? Mm -hmm. We don't know, but certainly the Lord could have whispered that in her ear. Yeah. And I think too, time in his presence helps us with that tenacity to keep pressing on when we don't see the results we're looking for. And oftentimes the results we're looking for never come. come I know. Yes. I know the shift in my thinking that happens when I spend intentional time with him in that, like, even just in the world that I'm living in, if I don't spend intentional time with him, I try to find my affirmation or I try to find my, um, 
the proof that I'm doing right or doing good or something like that in the world. Who's next on your list then after so Anna? Anna, Anna or, I'm sorry. So we talked about Anna. Now we're going to talk about Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth, Elizabeth, the Bible tells us she's righteous. Her and her husband were blameless before the Lord. And we think they were living these purview, but he was the priest. She was his wife. Of course they have it all together. And yet we see lack. Hmm. We see a hope and a dream of a child that has not come and not that he's not come. It's past time where he could come. And so I wonder with her, you know, we know she's a woman of faith, but in, we can, we can tell by her reaction to hearing that, that she'll become pregnant is, oh, the Lord has taken away my shame. And so that gives us a little clue of of the battle that Anna was fighting within herself, especially in a culture and in a time where children were everything. And so then we get the news, of course, that Anna's going to have this baby in extremely old age. So it's not physically possible. And I wonder, did she give up praying for a baby? At some point you would think even as a woman, when you became in your seventies or eighties, you might say, I know this won't ever happen for me. And so we don't know that she did, but we, one thing I think is so beautiful with her is, so she finds out at one at this, you know, she's expecting a baby and she stays in seclusion in her home for the first five months. And we think, why? Like you would think I would be walking around town telling everyone I'm having a baby. I've been praying for this for 80 years, but she doesn't do a thing. And I, I often think that one, we don't really see visible proof of a pregnancy until about the fifth or sixth month. And two, I don't think she wanted to hear all the doubters. I think that she was holding on to that promise that the Lord's message through his angel came and told her husband, and she was going to hang on to that. And no one was going to make her doubt. Cause I'm sure there could have been lots of moments where she's like, really mm -hmm. I'm pregnant? I don't know. I'm not showing any signs or symptoms. And so then we have her who of course says, yes, the Lord is going to do this for me. And we have her give birth to one of the greats, John the Baptist. I mean, can you imagine what kind of child he was to raise? I, I just think, you know, he, they, they describe him as this wild man. And I always think like Grizzly Adams or, you know, like this wild, my dad was always the big beard and the hunter. And, you know, and I think what a fun child that would have been to raise, but he's the forerunner. But then you know, we have this moment where her and Mary come together and um, she, the Holy Spirit fills Elizabeth and she knows, yeah. she knows that Mary is carrying her Lord, our Lord, John within her leaps for joy because he knows that Mary's carrying his Lord. And I think, oh my goodness. And so here in a time where she, I mean, Elizabeth's living the impossible. Hmm. So, so beautiful and exciting. And I think, oh my goodness. And sometimes I think older women, as, as we age, we think, what, what's my purpose? What's mm -hmm. my plan? And look, God is never done. He is never done with us. We, until like we take our last breath, he wasn't done with Elizabeth and he's certainly not done with us. Not that I want to have a baby at 80, but... <laughs> No thing. <laughs> but, what, but what can we birth at 80? You know, maybe that's the difference. Yeah. But what can we birth at 80? Because the Holy Spirit is still very much at work in us in order yes. to be a blessing to the world around us. What does that look like, though, given our experience, our personality, our gifts, you know, all of that. So right. I think that's beautiful. And like Anna, I think you know, the recognition comes from the knowing, right? Like you were saying, like, obviously she dealt with a heavy burden, or she wouldn't call it shame. She wouldn't, she, this was, this was an ongoing hurt for her. Some of us have those, right? This ongoing yes. hurt. Almost and yet, right. Good, yes. Good point. And, and yet there was a knowing enough of God that she could recognize him, even in a way she very much wasn't looking for him. And I right. think that's, yeah, I think that's another, it's just, it, it, it again, just goes to, we, we see him and understand him through the intentionality of making space for him in our hearts. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep. You do such a beautiful job. I get chills when I listen to you talk about these. And it's wonderful. So let's talk about the third then. Of course, Mary. I mean, you know, I've always said, um, when I've speak, spoke at women's conferences about Mary, I said, here's the thing I always see with Mary. I see some that want to give her all the credit and I see some who don't want to give her any. And I think she's right there in the middle. She deserves to be looked at for sure. So we come upon Mary. She is a girl 
probably 13 to 14 years old, a girl who is visited by an angel multiple times and has to think, am I really seeing what I'm seeing? Is this real? And her whole future is in the balance here. Her husband is set up for her. I mean, everything that should be happening to a, a girl in Israel is happening for Mary. Her husband's there. He's a good man. They're going to have a life and a family. And that's probably all that she had on her radar. And so then we have Gabriel appear and tell her, and she says the biggest yes of all, she really does. I mean, a yes that is affecting us today. She said yes to carrying God's son. She said yes, that the Holy Spirit could overshadow her. And then I just think the bravery that it took for her to walk that out from beginning until the end. I mean, she is the only human that was with Christ his entire earthly walk. Oh my goodness. I think it is important. I know. I think it is important to look at her because there's all, there's so much that's not written, but if we have any human emotional intelligence at all, right, we can see in the gaps of her story, how difficult it must have been at times. Um, uh, I just, it's everywhere really. Um, And it it comes in in some of the interactions she has with Jesus when he is older. I think you can almost feel that I've been waiting a long time to be justified. I've been waiting a long time for whatever, you know, I can almost feel that it doesn't say it, but I think there's like Elizabeth, like Anna, who likely carried the grief of her life, not going the way that she expected, like Elizabeth carrying some kind of grief, shame, her life didn't go the way maybe she felt it should have like Mary, whose life was sort of hijacked almost, if you will. Right. right? And didn't go the way she expected. And yet there is a submission in not just in action, but in spirit, don't you think? Like yes. um, in spirit to being used by the Lord in the way he designs, mm-hmm. even though it wasn't the way I expected. I struggle mm-hmm. with that in my life. I will just be honest about that to really be able to say there's this prayer by John Wesley that I have a love hate relationship. When one of the lines says, you know, put me to work or put me aside. And I'm not quoting it exactly right, but that's the one that I always pause on because I'm like, well, really don't really put me aside, whatever that means to you, you know, and right. I, think, I think it would be possible for all these women to have felt put aside. And, yes. and yet they lived from a place of believing. It seems I, we can't know for sure, but, it, but their actions would demonstrate that they lived from a place of believing that the Lord actually did not put them aside. That wasn't right. the Lord. Uh, no, yeah. no. I mean, they, and they're, they're, I think, and you just wonder what their childhood looked like, yeah. how, you know, that, that were the scriptures told of them. And then the, the words of the prophets would have been a common thing that they would have heard. And did they connect that? Yeah. Like these, God's, the Holy scriptures, the prophetic word, and this is happening in my life. Yeah. We don't know, but we do know this. And Simeon points it out when, again, they're at the stairs and Anna's there. And and he said, it will be as if a sword pierces your heart as well. He says to Mary, and I wonder what she thought at that moment. What does that mean to a new mother? And the, in the hard, hard walk she would take to the cross. Um, I I can't imagine as a mother Mm -mm. ever, ever enduring yet Mary endures she yeah. faithfully walks in, of course, is there at the, at the resurrection as well. Yeah. Okay. What a yeah. glory day that has. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 So I, I know that you, I've, I've either heard you say, or, or written, read what you've written about just how important it has been to you in your walk to see the examples of women being important to Jesus, right? How has that encouraged you? Why, why do you, why do you, re- what do you receive, I guess, from knowing that women were important to Jesus? Cause I, I, I feel the same way. I see that all over the gospels, how women oh. were not only seen, known, but valued, um, yes. lifted up, even pointed to as an example, um, by Jesus and, um, cared for in a way that was unique, I think. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'll let you speak to that. Why is that? How does that move you? <clears throat> and I say that I'm actually in a, in the process of reading through the gospels, all four of them through Lent, which of course just show us story after story of women. And, um, you know, 
I don't know about you, but I don't hear the stories of women really preached on a Sunday morning. I hear them at a women's conference here or there, or maybe I hear uh, points, um, you know, that might reflect, they might reference them, but their stories. So we think of all the women in the gospels. And so we look at how Jesus takes the women who nobody wanted the adulteress, the anointing sinner, um, the woman at the well. So these are all outcasts, yet Jesus welcomes them. Mm -hmm. Jesus honors them above the religious men of the day, actually. And then we see um, a shift and we see an intimate friendship with Mary and Martha, and he loved them both. So often we think he loved Mary more. No, he loved Martha and Martha loved serving him. She just needed to relax a little, that's all. But we need the Marthas in the world. I'm a Martha, somebody has to do the dishes. Somebody has to cook the food. Um, and then of course we see the intimacy that he wants with Mary. He wants us to sit with him. He wants us to listen for his voice. Then the most beautiful and we um, is the woman with the issue of blood. And um, of course, she's just like, if I can just touch him, if I can just touch him, I will be well. 12 years of bleeding. We can get into that. I mean, what an awful, awful thing. Not only ghosted from her physical body, but from her everything from every celebration, from touching her family members, from everything. But here's what Jesus says to her after she touches him and he realizes it. He says, daughter. Hmm. That's huge in that culture. And it, it, when, if we look at um, you know, um, the culture of the mi Middle East, family is everything. To be called daughter, that had to just fill her. And he says, your faith has healed you. Hmm. Uh, daughter and what a statement he made that everyone heard as he called her daughter so the gospels are so filled no matter where we are at in our life we can be one of these women at different times in our life he still says come i love you i hold you up i'll heal you all those things so um it's just so beautiful so i encourage anyone if you're feeling far from god mm -hmm. read through the gospels yeah you know, focus on those stories of all the women who he interacted with. It's just so beautiful. Mm -hmm. I love that. Thank you for pointing that out about daughter, uh, because making that public statement to me, I think, I think that would have been so affirming, even if the blood hadn't dried up. Do you know what I'm, because sometimes I think when we can feel like an outcast or isolated, and we can experience a, a moment with Jesus where we know we are welcome as his child, then I think it gives us a strength for a new day of bleeding, whatever that looks like in our life. Right. right. And I think, yeah. And there's such a power in his, it's, it's affirming, but it's also confirming where like, um, whatever lie you're believing about your identity, it, it can't share space with us right here in this moment. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. That's powerful yeah, stuff, no Devon. Why, Thank you. He calls me daughter. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you've commented before how it moves you also to just to know God brings women together. Talk to us a little bit about why you feel like sisterhood in Christ is important. What does that, what does that do for us? You think? Oh, everything. everything. <laughs> like I, I, you know, we, of course we live in a time where everyone's comparing, everyone's looking, everybody's uh, measuring themselves. Why do we do that? I was, I'll, I'll, why? I know. Problem? I agree. Yeah. That's not a disagreement. Why? Why do we yes. do that? Yeah. Because I, that is not how it's designed right. to be. Mm -hmm. We're designed to be work together and um, we really have to fight that. And I also think so important that we invest in our friendships. Mm. We take the time, we take the time to sit and talk. We take that time to be together. But um, I was recently, the Bible study um, that I do with a group of friends, we're looking at the whole book of Proverbs. And so I was looking at the Proverbs 31 woman and you know, all her characteristics, so many, she's perfect in every way. And um, often I would think, are you kidding me? You know, you'd always hear that on Mother's Day or, you know, and they would do this big listing. And then I got to really looking at that proverb. And it was interesting because King Lemuel wrote Proverbs 31 and, and we would don't know almost nothing about him. Some commentaries mention maybe he's a pen name of King Solomon that he used just for poetry. But the very first verse of Proverbs 31 says this, says the sayings of King Lemuel, these, this is an utterance my mother taught me. 
And then we go on to the Proverbs 31 woman. And so then when we come to the realization that this is a mother's wish for her son's wife, and all of these characteristics come into play, we realize something, she doesn't really exist hmm. in one woman, but where she does exist. So if we look at ourselves as women of Christ, women who are the bride of Christ, we collectively are her. We are, mm. we all have, you know, we have some who, yes, they are up in the dark making dinner, a great dinner, prepping their food, grocery shopping, organizing it all. And then we have other women who are fighting for justice and who are, you know, bugging the government for equality. And um, we collectively make up that radiant bride. That's why we need each other. Mm. One of us cannot do it all. <laughs> together so beautifully and of course we see that in Mary and Elizabeth you know I I always in, as their story intersects and Elizabeth or Mary's knocking on Elizabeth's door and of course Elizabeth welcomes her in you know Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months yeah. and imagine what they did during that time I'm sure they ate I'm sure they laughed I'm sure they cooked and cleaned and did the laundry together cried and cried. every once in a while I looked at each other and said can you believe we're pregnant right <laughs> Like, and Mary probably kept touching Elizabeth's belly going, the angel told me this. Because <laughs> we're girls, so, that's what we do. <laughs> right. Exactly what we should be doing. Yeah. Exactly mm -hmm. what we should be doing. And I think, I don't know about you, Angie, but when I spend time with a good friend, I come home better. Yeah. I come home better as a daughter, as a friend, as a wife, as a mother, I come back better. I love what you're saying about how together we are, this woman and, and what you said earlier about comparison, because I think there's this like scarcity fear or something. Like if you're really good, like I sit here listening to you, you are an amazing storyteller. You I've gotten chills several times just by your, like your ability to, um, I don't know, you just, you move me with your description of, you know, these women and I have a choice in that. Do I not? I can be like, dang, I don't do that as well as Devon. Or I can lean into it and be like, you're just encouraging the heck out of me today. Thank you. You know, and that isn't that our choice when we're, yes. I mean, always together. I choose to just be encouraged by you today <laughs> because I just, I, yes. And I, but I think we can, we can feel like if you're good at something, that's what I'm trying to get at. If you're good at something, then I can't, I'm lacking somehow. Right. Like, and like, the truth is we might both be good at the same thing and can support each other, or we might be good at such different things that it's not even fair to compare anyway. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I'm one of those people that I'm like, of course, like intense, but I love people who are calm. Like I gravitate to them, those calm, steady. And I think I need those people yeah. in my life. Those yeah. people who really are like thoughtful when they speak and I learn from them and yes. Yeah, we yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we can never go. If you, I think it comes with age and wisdom too, of knowing like, oh my gosh, you know, like I love artistic people. I could not paint a painting or draw a stick figure. I could do none of that, but I love other people's stuff. But you immediately think like, well, I should try that. Mm -hmm. I think when you get to know yourself as you go through life, you're like, don't bother. Maybe not. No. <laughs> Just appreciate the other, the other. I will tell you one thing. When my boys leave the house, I will not suggest cycling to my husband. But I think it's awesome <laughs> that that's what you and your husband do. <laughs> And I, that is like, that is how, that is the end of my athletics <laughs> at the end. I love it. I love it. Well, tell us, um, just before I, I let you go, tell us a little bit about what I see that you've just completed or you're working on, you're getting out into the world. There's a book of poetry, right? For women. Will you talk yeah. to us a little bit about that? So mm -hmm. I, I was, um, of course, COVID still, we're just yeah. now where everything's open. And so I had, um, been at um, a lady's house that I had to deliver some papers, paperwork to. And um, I was just sitting with her and we were chatting and she's an older woman and she's a widow. And um, we were sitting together. And after I went back to the office, after we visited for a little bit, I couldn't stop thinking about her and her life. And I knew enough, you know, she'd been a customer at my office for a long time. And I knew enough about her life to know that she had lost children, that she had lost her husband. And I just kept writing little notes to myself about her. And it turned into just a little poem. And it's, I called it the cultivator because her lawn was just beautiful. I could tell that she was a gardener, you know, even in the, oh, it was a rainy November day here, but I could see in her lawn that it was taken well care of. And then I just started looking around at other women. 
And I would, I looked at my, some of my good friends. I looked at like some acquaintances that I know, like I know them, uh, you know, kind of roundabout. And then I like stalked women. I don't, don't know. <laughs> I like watch them like there's this woman um, at a restaurant that I would often go to and pick up lunch and she was always sitting at a, at a table and with a white linen cloth and a glass of red wine and her lunch and I could tell she was battling cancer her hair was usually wrapped and I thought look at you out for lunch, like owning the day, living your life. And so I wrote a little poem about her called The Fighter. And so I, what I did is I created this little chap book and it's poems about women, um, all different women, all different things. Um, and I said to my husband, I just want to put it together. And I did, I self-published that with our local print shop here because one, I wanted to give them the business and they would work with me. Like they would make mock-ups for me and I could take it back and we could work together. And so I wanted to offer it just as a gift one woman could give to another. So I said, I want them a size. They can go in a, like, a, like a six by nine envelope. People can, a woman can just mail it off to a friend. So that's been the latest project. So I just received my first box of books. Oh, last- yay. Yay. Ah! So is it available on your website now? It is. If you go to my website, I have a whole page about that book and some photos and all that good stuff. But that yeah. sounds lovely. I'm going to check it out. And your website is a scriptured heart dot com do I have that correct yeah Yeah. so come find me there yeah same thing I'm on Facebook a scriptured heart.com there's a Facebook live about the poem and I did read some of the poems that night great so but it's been just the fun it's been so much fun and I love poetry and honestly uh, looking at poetry there's the poetry sphere is strange because a lot of poetry is weird if you would look into, and then Christian poetry is very small. There's not a lot of it. So it was just a fun little project. I'm so glad that sounds on. really fun. Yeah, it does. It sounds really fun. Yeah. So it was, and it helped me to kind of live life with my eyes open. Watching. Yes. Yes. It, the COVID season has been interesting for things like that. I think it's, it, yeah. it's like just, it's a little bit like a snow globe or something that you shake and put back down and you're like, I'm not exactly sure how, where things are falling in my life right now, you know, because it just kind of feels a little unsettled or it has anyway. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. And you just yeah. find yourself fiddling with things maybe you normally wouldn't have, yep. mm-hmm. but yep. who knows what will stem from those. Things. I know. I think some things in, in my life, in my day will go back to a place that they were, but it's been long enough that I'm pretty sure some things won't, you know? Um, exactly. So, yeah. mm-hmm. exactly. Yeah. Just like, you know, sometimes we have to be in those quiet, dark places for yeah. some things to take root yeah. or some mm-hmm. things to die. To so. die. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So, Hey, one thing I always like to ask before I close is, is there anything right now that you are reading, studying, listening to, uh, uh, watching anything like that, that's keeping you connected to God, anything, any resources yes. you'd like to share with us? So I just finished this book on the author's name is Lindsay Cricks. It's K-R-I-N-K-S, Crinks, I think it is. And it's called Praying With Our Feet. That sounds unique. Yes. And so, of course, you know, everything that's happened in our country, I try to, I want to be well read. I want Mm -hmm. to see what's happening all over that may not be happening in little tiny Greenville, PA with 5,000 people. Um, And so she wrote a book um, and and she actually is a... um, street chaplain and the streets of Nashville, Tennessee. And she leads a ministry called the open table. And so it's a ministry to the homeless people. And she shares a lot of their stories. Um, and it was such an eye opener for me. I needed, I needed that. I needed to be reminded of how people within our country are suffering yeah. and how sometimes we write them off and how God loves them. Yes. And um, I, it was been such a good revelation. So I highly recommend it. Um, and of course, podcast wise, any podcast she's on, I'm like stalking her <laughs> into all of them. <laughs> but yes, it was, it was really good and good. a good reminder. And sometimes, and as she mentions in her book, they're unseen. You look at Nashville, Tennessee, and you think, wow. And she's down underneath in the yeah. tent cities and in the subways and in all the places where people who are hurting, hurting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, 
Good. So, That's a good, I'll put that in the show notes uh, along with Devon's website and all that kind of good information. And um, De- Devon, this has been just a delight. Thank you so much for joining us today and encouraging us. And um, yeah, all the best with this little book of poetry. I think it's fantastic. So, um, and thank you for listening today and we will sign off until next time. Peace. I love how Devon reminded us how much women need each other. We are good at different things, friend. Each woman in the gospel stories serves as an important, unique example of how God sees, knows, and loves us. Together, we are the women of Jesus. Thank you so much for listening. I pray that wherever your day takes you, you are walking in the confident knowledge that you are a beloved, cherished child of God. Peace.